Hello, everybody, and welcome to our very first episode of On Point. I am your host, Josh Porter, and today we are going to be talking about capital reserves for construction projects. All right, so let's get into it. The uh, people who need capital reserves the most are typically like your condo and homeowner associations, but also private entities like uh, large commercial property owners can also uh, have a need for uh, making sure that they put away money for capital reserves. So what are capital reserves? Well, uh, capital reserves are the money that you put away uh, in order to save up for when you need to replace a roof or when you need to replace a pool heater or something um, like that. So uh, typically in the condo and HOA industry, what you'll find is that they will hire a professional company to come out and look at all of these components, uh, tell them how much longer they're going to last, how much longer, uh, in other words, how much longer the roof is gonna last or how much longer the roads are gonna last in your community, and then what it's gonna cost to replace them. And uh, they put all this together in a nice uh, document, which we recall, which we all call a reserve study report. So typically uh, in a reserve study report, um, we, we cover things like uh, roofing, paving, painting. These are actually required by statutes in most uh, U.S. states. Uh, and then anything else over $10,000. Um, and the idea behind this being that uh, when you get this study and you get this comprehensive plan that your organization would then have sort of a blueprint to follow. Now what we're doing today is not going to be an exhaustive discussion on capital reserves for construction projects and it's not going to be um, uh, you know, like, like I do a continuing education course that's an hour long. So this is sort of going to be kind of like a crash course, like a one-on-one -on -one course, if you will. And we're just going to kind of touch on some of the basic concepts and some of the terms um, that I think get a lot of people hung up when they're talking about reserve studies. So hopefully you guys can find something useful out of here uh, when, when you're ready to get a, a reserve study done of your association or you're putting together your own reserve budget planning. So the two main uh, type of uh, budgets that we're going to be talking about today um, are the line item budget and the cash flow budget. So um, here I have showing for you uh, the different types um, and, and what I want to kind of show in this uh, flow diagram is the, 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 the conceptual idea behind the way these two things work. Um, what we're really talking about is we're talking about bank accounts, right? But when you determine how much money you put into that bank account, there are two modes that you can follow, two thought processes. Uh, so in the first one, we're talking about the line item plan. And uh, in, in this plan, we're talking about, um, you know, we're, we, we want to look at how much money do we have to put into our account uh, for each item that needs to be covered. So how much money do I need to put away for the roof? How much money do I need to put away for the uh, pool or the painting of our building or the roads um, and then that money you figure that out on a per item basis so if you have a hundred thousand uh, dollar asset for example or a hundred thousand dollar construction project and it needs to be done every 10 years you're going to put away ten thousand dollars a year well then all that money goes into uh, the reserve accounts and then out of that reserve accounts, you spend that money only on that line item that you have in there. Um, this is kind of the more expensive way to do things and we'll show you that a little bit later, but that's the one plan where you kind of look at each item individually. Yes, the money all goes into the same account, but technically each item is sort of like its own account. You can only spend money out of that account in that way. In the second plan, the cash flow plan, uh, what you really do is you sort of look at it backwards. You need to take a big picture look at your account and you need to say, okay, I'm going to look at the bank balance and I'm going to make sure that that bank balance never goes below zero dollars. Or you can set some sort of value for that, that you don't want your, your account to fall below. We call that a threshold. Then when you've considered that and you've figured that out, then you figure in how much money do I need to collect to put into that bank account in order to make sure that I never run out of money, right? Uh, and then you spend that money as needed. You don't spend it, it's not, it's not technically designated as a per line item or on a, on a specific uh, aspect. 
or, or asset rather, um, but you can spend that money however you like out of that account as long as it's on one of the items in the reserve budget. So uh, in summary, what we're looking at is you're looking at um, this concept, right? Where we're always thinking about the account. We're thinking, okay, we have money that comes into the reserve budget. We have money that goes out of the reserve budget. When we're looking at the money that goes in, you're gonna do this in one of two ways. You're gonna do this uh, following what we talked about first, which was the line item plan. Uh, and then the second option that you're gonna have is you're gonna have the cash flow plan. Okay, we talked about those two. Um, when you go to spend money out of your account, if you have followed the line item plan, you can only do the line item spending plan. All right. But if you have followed the cash flow plan, I, I apologize. Actually, you can do the line item plan. You can do line item spending, um, or you can do, uh, or you can do the pool spending. You have those both those options. If you're going to follow the cash flow plan, you can only follow the pooled spending plan. And we're gonna get into that a little bit more and what that means because usually um, any organization like a condo association or a homeowners association has to vote on how they're going to spend their money, whether they're gonna follow a line item plan or a pooled spending plan. Um, and then if they follow the pooled spending plan, this opens them up and allows them to follow the cash flow plan. So, uh, so here's your possible combinations, okay? You can put money into the account using the line item plan uh, and then you can take money out of the account following a line item spending plan. You can put money into the account following a uh, line item plan, but you can go ahead and spend it as a pooled plan. Now, what does that mean? That means like, well, let's say in your account, you, you only have $100,000 set aside for your roof and it's time to do your roof, but then you find out, well, um, that roof is actually gonna cost us $150,000. Well, if you follow a pooled spending plan, you can pull that $50,000 out from other accounts, and then you can spend that money uh, on the, the, the roof overage, and then you can just make it up later. Uh, the final plan is sort of what we talked about before, which was you, you, put, you have a cash flow in. So the amount of money you take in isn't dependent on each line item, but rather on the cash flow, making sure the account never goes below zero. Uh, then of course, when you do a cash flow plan, sort of like what we talked about on the previous frame, you can only follow the pooled spending plan. That's the only option if you're gonna do a cash flow in. So let's talk about pooled spending a little bit before we get into this. Um, the pooled spending plan, uh, what, this is, what this means is that uh, the, the money that you have in your account is not designated for specific items. So take the idea of the $100,000 construction project that you have to do every 10 years. You're going to put away $10,000 a year into that project. Well, at the end of 10 years, you've got $100,000 in there, right? The, uh, the idea being that, um, that if the project goes over and you have not adopted a pooled funding plan, you cannot take money from other, you can't take it from the roads to cover, cover, uh, come up with that uh, um, overage. So if, you have a, if you're following a line item plan with a line item spending and you've only got $100,000 in that line item, you can only spend $100,000 on that line item. So how do you make up the difference uh, if let's say the roof cost $150,000 or the construction project cost $150,000? Well, then you're going to have to special assess the, the, the residents of your condo or HOA in order to get that extra $50,000. Um, if you're a private entity, this really isn't, doesn't really concern you because you're not restricted by the Florida statutes or, 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 you're, or we're in Florida, so I always say the Florida statutes, but you're not restricted by whatever your state statutes uh, uh, say for, for reserves. Uh, but this is really dealing mostly with homeowners associations and condo associations. So in order to adopt a pooled funding plan, what you do is you, you vote as an association to say, well, we don't care what the project cost. As long as there's money in the bank to cover it, you can spend that money in the bank to cover it. So basically you're looking at all the cash that you have. If you had 100,000 in there for project A and you had 50,000 in there for project B and you had 50,000 in there for project C, you have 200,000 in the bank and project A cost 150, then so be it, you can spend out of that 200,000. That's the, the idea of pooled funding is that you're pooling all of the funds together into one account and you can spend it any way you want out of that account as long as you're still spending it on reserve uh, projects. So getting into some examples of how this math works out and why, it, why, it, why does all of this matter? Well, you know, that's what we're gonna show you right now. All right, so in this example, we have um, some various projects that are going on. We've got a roofing project, we've got a painting project, We've got a paving project and so on. 
So if you look at these and look at the math, and I tried to make this very simple math. Take, let's, like, let's look at the very first project, the roofing project, okay? In the roofing project, uh, let's say it costs $250,000 and it lasts uh, 25 years. So you gotta replace your roof every 25 years. This is real simple math. This means under a line item plan, I would need to put away $10,000 a year, right? Makes, makes intuitive sense. So the, uh, the, the, we do this for every line down. In the painting, you can see that the painting cost $100,000. You do that every 10 years in this example. Um, and that means you need to put away $10,000 a year, right? Seems pretty straightforward. Anybody with a sheet of paper and a calculator can do a line item plan. At the end of our example, you'll see that your, your total that you have to put away each year is $47,333, all right? So what this looks like on a graph, now you don't need to know every single thing on here and what it all means, uh, but what you kind of want to look at it quickly is just the colors. So the blue line uh, in this indicates the amount of contributions, total accumulated contributions that you have put into the bank uh, year to year and adding up, right? And then the red line is how much you're spending out of that account. So you can see from the year uh, 2021, until 2029, we haven't spent anything because the red line is at zero. So we've spent no dollars, right? That's how you read this chart. Well, uh, and actually all the way up to 20, um, uh, all the way up to, oops, I kind of got lost here. All right, so even all the way up to uh, 2031, or 2030 actually. Okay, and it isn't until 2031 where we have our first expenditure. And you can see that expenditure causes the green line, which is the amount of money left in the bank. It's our bank balance. Okay, you can see that up here. The green line is your bank balance. Uh, you can see that that bank balance then drops. So that's kind of how this, this chart works. And as time goes on and you spend more money and you spend more money, the account drops and the account drops, right? The balance does. All right, so what's most important, the most important thing to look at in this thing is that most reserve plans and studies are done over a 30 year period. And so what we're looking at is, is this figure right here. That's the most important thing that we care about in the year 2046. That's the lowest the account will ever get. Well, the interesting thing with this is that you have $330,000 uh, and some change of everybody's money sitting in there doing nothing for you, okay? It's essentially earning nobody interest, um, and, it, and, and it also means that you had relatively high contribution rates. If you remember, the contribution rate for this thing was 47,333, okay? So that's that's what's important here. So then when you come over here and we compare this to the cash flow plan, okay, and this, this first section here just sort of summarizes, we've got that 47,000 you're putting away each year. Remember we talked about that. And you're also looking at the account, which we just showed on the graph, the account never goes below 333,000, okay? And that was in the year 20, what was that? Uh, 2046, okay. So, then comparing that to the cash flow plan, all right? So now if you, if you do things backwards and you say, well, I don't want $330,000 sitting in my account. I wanna minimize how much is sitting in my account. So what we've done is we've set that minimum threshold to 80 grand. We're saying we don't ever want the account to fall below $80,000. So you see why, I'm, why when I showed earlier, you're really, you're looking at the balance first. You're looking at, at, at this first. How much do I wanna leave in the account then you calculate everything backwards. Well, when you do that, you'll find out that you only actually have to, as an association, put away 37,700 a year in order to accomplish this goal. So uh, you can clearly see right off, the, right off the bat that there's a difference here of, of $10,000, right? $10,000 difference, and this is pretty significant, right? So I'll show you on a, uh, on a graph what, that, uh, what the cash flow plan looks like. So again, you can see the blue line is the amount of money you've put in. Your red line uh, is your expenditures. We've got an expenditure here. We've got an expenditure here. We've got a big expenditure here. Okay, so you got your big expenditures. And, and by the time you follow all of your big expenditures, you look at what's left in the bank account balance and you've got your 80 grand down there. All right. So this is, this is, this is a, an account, okay, that over 30 years never ran out of money. The association didn't run out of money in their reserves, but now you only had $80,000 of everybody's money sitting in there instead of $300,000. And instead of having to collect $47,000 uh, uh, a year, you're only collecting $37,000 a year. All right, big difference.
So what we kind of want to take away from this is the fact that you have these options available to you when you're putting away money for these projects. And you want to make sure that you understand some of the terms. Uh, hopefully, you know, this is, I know this was a bit of a crash course today. We kind of went through a lot of this fast. We will be doing um, my full uh, presentation on, on this. Uh, we will be getting that on our YouTube channel eventually. But hopefully I just wanted to kind of give you guys some ideas of what you're looking at um, when you're discussing these topics. Um, hopefully sort of make sense of the difference between a cash flow plan and a line item plan. And one of the problems that I have found in the industry is that a lot of people that prepare these studies for clients, for condos and HOAs, for example, um, they convolute a lot of terms. They'll throw in a whole bunch of other terms. They'll throw in a partial funding plan. They'll call it uh, a, a threshold plan. They'll call it a pooled plan. Um, but what I really want you to take away from today is this understanding that you have to figure out how your money is gonna come into the account and you have to figure out how your money is gonna go out of the account. And according to most state statutes, if you're going to follow a pooled spending plan, which will allow you then to do a threshold plan, and which means you can collect less money from your residents, which makes everybody happier, you typically have to vote on that and get a majority vote and get that passed. So, hey, hopefully you guys uh, found something useful out of this. You know, hit us up in the comments, hit us up, uh, email, however you want to contact us, let us know. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you.